since then, uh, we've, we've kept in touch to the point where uh, I feel very uh, honored and privileged to introduce Arlen Schumer. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Wherever my uh, Silver Age book, can I have that sent up? Yeah, can you bring it back up here? Thank you so much. And I want to thank everybody for being here. What a beautiful turnout. And are you ready for comics? Yeah! Are you ready for Captain America and Sirenko? Yeah! Okay, let's get the lights down and then we can begin. Okay, we ready on video? Okay, folks, here we go. When Captain America throws his mighty shield, all those who chose to oppose his shield are killed. They be led to a fight and a jubilee skills, and the red and the white and the blue will come through when Captain America throws his mighty shield. And there was the first issue of Steranko's Captain America, dated February 1969, which means it actually came out in late 1968, probably um, November, maybe. And that means that Steranko himself drew this famous trilogy of stories and wrote them sometime, I would say, in the summer or fall of that turbulent year of 1968. Now, when we look at this first issue, those of us who knew about Steranko and loved him, we were surprised to see a giant Hulk, and we were surprised to see Steranko taking on Captain America, because we were blown away the previous year, 1968, by his work on Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., and incredible covers like this, and the fact that Steranko, I'm a little ahead of myself here, sorry, <laughs> You know, these computers are very sensitive. You can see the psychedelic influence that Steranko was working with in 1968. This image comes out pretty much at the same time Peter Max, a mainstream commercial artist, comes on in 1968 at the peak of psychedelia and the peak of Peter Max's, what he called his cosmic artwork. So not only was Steranko bringing psychedelia into comics, but on the flip side, Steranko also can do gothic as well, which is really the flip side of, of um, the psychedelia. Now, Captain America is Steranko's, of all the characters he's done, is his favorite character. It was on the cover of Steranko's groundbreaking history of comics that came out in 1970, which is still the definitive history of the golden age of comics. It had a volume two that came out in 1972. As great as an artist and a graphic designer Steranko is, that's how great of a historian he is. Here he is, right about 1970. So Steranko was born in 1938, so he's 32, I think, mm -hmm. at this point. And there he is with the blow up of the second volume. Now, it's interesting showing black and white graphics because some of his most powerful graphics were these shield covers, and especially this cover appearing right in the middle, again, of the psychedelic 1968. Then, six or nine months later, when he goes to do um, Captain America, he does another one of these white covers, but this time in full color. And it's this image and it's images like this that are why we're here tonight to celebrate what is now the 50th anniversary of Jim Steranko's Captain America trilogy. And my name is Arlen Schumer, and I want to thank you all for being here. I did a book called The Silver Age of Comic Book Art, which is here, and we, uh, I'll be signing and selling it afterwards. And that book is dedicated to the artists of the Silver Age, which is roughly 1956 to 72, depending on how you want to argue the dates. But in the same way art historians look back 500 years at the great Renaissance masters of the human figure, Michelangelo and da Vinci and Raphael, I truly believe 500 years from now, future art historians are going to look back at these men as the giants of the human figure in our time. And those are quotes from each one of the artists. As you can see, Steranko claims he's not an artist, he's a storyteller. So keep that in mind as we go through 
this incredible Captain America trilogy. Now that's the double page spread of um, each artist in my book, and I ghost the image that you saw in my intro of Captain America. We'll talk about this image later, but he's really uh, initially known for Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, younger members of the audience that aren't familiar with the comic book background of Jim Saranko will know of Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. by the movies, by Samuel Jackson, the TV show on ABC. It all comes out of what Saranko did. And how did Saranko get started doing S.H.I.E.L.D.? Well, how did S.H.I.E.L.D. get started? It all goes back to basically Bond in the 60s and the impact, especially Goldfinger in 1964, jump-started the, the spy craze, along with Beatlemania and Batmania. Those are the three Bs of the 1960s in terms of pop culture. Now, comic books always reflected the pop culture. So how did industry giant DC Comics deal with the Bond craze in idiotic ways like this? But how did Marvel deal with the Bond craze? Well, Marvel had Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby went to war with Patton in World War II, so he comes up with his version of DC Sergeant Rock, a World War II um, Sergeant Fury. But you know how we know about reboots now in pop culture when something gets rebooted? I think the rebooting of Sergeant Fury by Jack Kirby, taking him out of World War II and bringing him into the 60s as a secret agent and coming up with some comic book cockamamie explanation for how he didn't age, didn't they reveal it was some formula? Oh, who knows what? Does it really matter? The point is, is this is the first pop culture reboot, is the rebooting of Sergeant Fury into Nick Fury. And then, that's uh, August of 65. Then we get to the end of 1966. In the intervening year, Kirby mostly did layouts. At that time, the nation Marvel Comics, Kirby was spreading himself over the entire line, doing layouts for other artists. But Nick Fury was one half of this team book with Ditko's Doctor Strange, and it would be considered maybe Marvel's B feature or even a C feature, except when we get to this issue. Because what do we see but this strange name, Staranko? And here is the splash page. And what is different about this splash page? Yeah, layouts by Jolly Jack Kirby, like he was doing for everybody, but what is this name of the person doing the illustrations we had never heard of? What is a Steranko? And within two or three issues of Steranko inking or tight penciling over Kirby's layouts, what do we get but for the first time in the 1960s, a Marvel comic written and illustrated by an artist? Now, if you know your Marvel history, Kirby did the storytelling, Stan Lee would come in, dialogue the panels, but no artist had been allowed, quote unquote, to write and draw their own stuff until Steranko starts doing it in early 1967. And he starts paying homage to his favorite artist. This is to the great Wally Wood, the science fiction artist from the 1950s. Now the other artist that Steranko is constantly paying homage to is, of course, Kirby himself, emblemized by Kirby's greatest character, Captain America. Now, a brief little history. Three years earlier, in 1964, Captain America is brought back by Kirby into the 1960s. He hadn't been published since the mid-50s. But with the rebirth of Marvel Comics and the death of John F. Kennedy, Kirby, out of his sorrow of Kennedy's loss, felt we need to bring, in a sense, Captain America, i.e. Kennedy, back into comics, and they did it with Captain America. Overnight success in the spring of 64, that gives him his new feature in November of 64, teamed up with Iron Man. And here is the first splash page. Now, Kirby has said the thing is the character from the Fantastic Four, the rock character, that most resembles his personality. He's like the thing, you know, very sudden, very emotional. But Captain America is the character that he most enjoys drawing because he said it's all about movement and about power and impact. And just that image alone bursting through the gl glass should tell you everything you need to know about Kirby's approach to Captain America. 
Then, in May of 65, he becomes the leader of the Avengers. So within one year, he goes from nobody knows who Captain America is from the mid-50s to being basically the leader of Marvel Comics. And then Kirby begins penciling the character, and in the mid-60s kind of goes through his peak. So this is February of 66. A year later, Saranko does his take on Kirby's Captain America. Two issues later, October 67, and here's one of his full page images. And when you see the kind of power and impact Kirby, uh, Saranko was trying to bring to Captain America, this is Kirby's Captain America from a year earlier. Now look at the power and impact of Kirby's drawing. And for you kids out there, learn the power of some people call these motion lines, force lines, but as a cartoonist, if you want to get power and impact and speed and motion on your page, just look at that as a single image primer. So Steranko looked at this and, and basically gave us Kirby back, but Kirby on steroids or Kirby on acid because he brought this psychedelic, all-encompassing worldview into the Nick Fury strip that was unlike any other comic art we had ever seen. Not only to kind of pseudo-psychedelic scenes like this, but then even, you know, uh, Fury in his bachelor pad in New York City, you know, look at the use of photography and the background for the skyline, and then you have a very hip piece of op art on the wall. Now, we're still trying to figure out years later, decades later, how did Steranko do these effects? But this was part of what made his art so fascinating and so intense. Now, the doyen of op art from 1965 is Bridget Riley. That's the major show when op art in New York was at its zenith. And you could see the influence on Steranko's shield from this image from that great first cover. But you can also see Steranko dipping back into the comic book history world for another influence, which is the great Will Eisner, who did the famous strip, The Spirit, in which he incorporated the logo of the spirit into the actual artwork. And Steranko, in incredible splash pages like this, was paying homage to Will Eisner. And you'll see, as we go on, many more um, Eisner-esque homages. But in that first issue, you actually had to turn the comic around to read the story to get across the idea that Nick Fury is in this kind of, you know, circular maze. And it's that kind of meta reading of a comic book that Steranko, as remember, he sees himself as a storyteller more than an artist. But at the same time, Steranko is doing psychedelic layouts in the middle of 1968, Robert Crumb is dropping acid on the West Coast and doing psychedelic layouts in underground comics. So the only difference between the two is one dropped acid and the other didn't. But it's basically the same thing. Now, in the spring of 68, Captain America is given his own book and Kirby's drawing it and you can see the older logo. And then a couple months later, Steranko gives us this incredible Hulk cover that I can do an entire electron because the face was not drawn by him. It was patched over by Maurice Severin and John Romita and I don't know how Steranko could ever look at this image, but I digress. Then, as S.H.I.E.L.D. is winding down, before he does Captain America, October 68, he decides to do a couple of X-Men issues. And you can see that he applies that same kind of Eisner-esque approach to title logos. In one issue, here's another double page spread, title splash. And then look at how he changes the X-Men logo for this incredible cover in November of 68, which is the same month that Steranko does this incredible shield cover where he had already stopped drawing the interiors. He just stayed doing these incredible covers. And once again, you can see the homage to Wally Wood in that incredible cover. And that's November of 68. Now we get January 69, right before Steranko starts doing Captain America. Kirby's still drawing Captain America. They decide to do an art, like retell his origin. But at this point, Kirby's, I think he's moving to Los Angeles. He can't keep drawing Captain America. 
So somehow Steranko decides with Stan Lee to do a trilogy. And it begins with this issue that comes out in February of 69. And when you open it up, this is the beautiful splash page. Now, right away, I mentioned Will Eisner before. To me, this classic Eisner splash page most resembles the mood and the feeling that I think Saranka was looking for in this splash page. But when you look at this sequence on top, which is a classic, people love talking about comics are like film on paper. Well, here's a perfect example. Now, once again, since Will Eisner's the D.W. Griffith of comics, that in the early 40s, he's giving us the language of comics, <coughs> things like this, sequences like this that made the idea that panels are like frames of a film and dealing with timing. That was an influence on the great Bernie Krigstein 10, 10 years later, working in EC Comics in the mid 50s to do this sequence in the famous story Master Race, one of the first uh, stories about the Holocaust in American pop culture. And even Steranko himself on S.H.I.E.L.D. had experimented with these cinematic panel design. So that's why when we got to Captain America a year or so later, this sequence, we were used to Steranko blowing our minds with these kind of sequences. And then you get that beautiful full page. Now, why does it say a Stan Lee Steranko production? This would lead the layman to think that Stan Lee obviously had something to do with this. You would think that maybe Stan Lee wrote it. Now remember, the way he worked with his artist in Marvel was he didn't come up with the ideas for the stories, the artist did. He would then just dialogue them, and that he called writing. But look at this photo feature from a year later in Marvel Annuals in 1969. So yeah, there's Stan Lee at that point, and there is the way Steranko looked at around that time, 1969. The caliph, caliph? Caliph of creativity. So, Basically, without going off on too much of a Stanley tangent, because I ate recently and I don't want to throw up, <laughs> you know, Stanley basically edited this. Now, if you know anything about editing, editing can be just a glorified traffic manager. Steranko wrote the story, drew it, he inked it in parts, even though it's credit to other inkers, but, you know, Stan Lee was the editor of Marvel Comics, and yet, whose name is first? Stan Lee's name. But let's talk about the other two great participants in this trilogy. You've got Joe Sinnott, the great inker, prince of pen and ink. Of course, he was Kirby's longtime inker on Fantastic Four. He also inked a stretch of his Captain America a year before. That's maybe Kirby's best stretch of Captain America. And then the lettering by Sam Rosen. I mean, just the fact that we have a picture of some of these guys is incredible. But you'll notice you know, lettering is the invisible art. Typography, when it works, you shouldn't even notice it. You should be reading the words. But I want you to notice as we go through Stranko's trilogy how great all the facets, all the different styles of lettering that Joe Rosen, uh, uh, Sam Rosen employs. And by the way, his brother, uh, Joe Rosen, came a little later and was a great letterer for Marvel Comics as well. So when you turn that page, we're hit with the first... Steranko double, not even double page spread per se, it's two individual pages, but this is what we're hit with. And the other thing you should notice as we go through this trilogy is the quality of the old school Bende dot coloring. Comic book coloring to me works when you do stylized, often monochromatic color schemes. So just look at what Steranko does here with very simple colors. You know, you got some blues, a little purple, oranges, yellows, but you'll notice as we go through this trilogy <coughs> how Steranko uses color and white space to tell his story. Now, you might think the writing might be redundant because we see two green hands smashing through, but we'll talk about that later. And of course, it's the Hulk. But see, once again, look at, look at um, Sam Rosen's lettering when it calls time for it to be outlined and bold like that, he bolds it. Now, maybe Steranko indicated that, you know, who knows. But just for a second, look at the choice of which words to make bold italic for emphasis versus Roman lettering. A lot of bad comic lettering only has one weight and one style. 
and that's considered modern. I think that's horrible lettering. To me, all the lettering you're going to see tonight is classic. That pose, by the way, was used in this English edition of Rolling Stone. Um, what is that? October 1969. So it came out right about the time, not too long after that issue. And this is why Marvel was considered hip, because they were being covered by the underground and alternative press in the late 60s. And it was because of Saranko's art that it gave the entire Marvel line a patina of, of psychedelia. And look, they're actually using the underground word comics instead of comics. So back to this page. The other thing you have to notice is that Steranko had to deal with full pages of advertising scattered throughout the comics, like everybody did, except most artists and storytellers just told their story over 24 pages, not really caring where the story fell out with those advertising breaks. But Steranko was very conscious of where he found out ahead of time where the ad pages would be, and he paced the story accordingly. So you're going to see that at various points, Steranko will pace things. I mean, this is, can you imagine this is what you have to deal with as a creator? That opposite your beautiful art is a giant flashlight ad. Then you turn the page. Again, look at the beautiful coloring. Look at also Steranko's use of white space to break up the page and to give it air and let the images breathe. So on the left side, you've got the entire background is white bleeding into the um, page margins. And just the different ways, like in the middle of the right-hand page, he breaks up the page space. And then look at the pacing. Steranko knows he's got yet another ad, so he always gives you a climactic, dramatic image at the bottom right of the page that makes you want to turn the page. God bless uh, Apple Keynote for some of these cheesy page turning effects. I, I try not to get too cheesy, <laughs> but every now and then a cheesy effect when used properly is less cheesy. But yeah, uh, you like these uh, vintage ads, by the way? This is what's not gonna do. It comes right in the middle of the story. And here's two more pages. Now, you can see that, I bet you Steranko had photo reference of a guy in this position. It looks to me a little forced, but Steranko, like all great illustrators, worked from photo reference. And you can see in various places, I'll point out, where he might have used that because he felt it would make for a dramatic uh, panel. And then again, look at that middle panel with the Hulk coming up at us, using that white space to give the Hulk's body a place to breathe. And then here is another dramatic emotional panel with your Wallywood edge lighting. We turn the page, and here's another, you know, he's got to deal with all this horrible advertising. But look at the storytelling. Look at the way the stylization of the way Steranko breaks up some of these panels. And, you know, that's not a realistic staircase or a realistic place, but it gets across the feeling of the story. Now, look at a classic Eisner spirit page in black and white. And look at some of the similarities, like the middle far right panel of the spirit and Commissioner Dolan coming down that stylized stairway. Looks like something out of a Busley Berkeley you know, musical or something. And then look at what Steranko did with his stairway. And you could see how much of an influence um, Eisner was on Steranko. And you got to remember, we kids reading this, we didn't even know who Will Eisner was. He was somebody from a long time ago. There were a couple reprints here and there. But most of the average Marvel reader reading this in 1969 did not know anything about Eisner at the time. And God bless now, there's so much great comic history that everybody now knows about people like Will Eisner. Here we turn the page. Now, Steranko himself said the reason why he took Captain America on was he felt, you know, Kirby was moving to California. He kind of let Captain America slide. Nothing was happening with the character. He really wanted to bring Captain America back to what he felt was the basics. And that meant giving him his sidekick again, Bucky Barnes, who died during World War II. But Rick Jones, who was like the, Buck, the new Bucky Barnes of the 1960s, in this story kind of becomes the new Bucky. 
So once again, we get to the bottom right page, up ahead, something heading this way, and Steranka would paste the story so that when you would turn the page, you'd be hit with this incredible double page spread. Now, double page spreads by Kirby and Captain America, shown here from like a year before, were commonplace in Captain America. You can go back to Kirby in the 1940s, and he was the first one to really make use of the double page spread in comic book storytelling. So Steranko was basically paying homage to Kirby when he was doing these double page spreads. Now, when you look at the way he designed this and composed it with the big face in the foreground, well, that's very much a classic Kirby trope of the big face in the foreground looking at the reader. So you can see, again, Steranko paying subtle homage to Kirby there. You turn the page, and you get this. And once again, as you glean these double-page spreads, notice everything we've been talking about, the coloring, the lettering, how expressive it is. And then, of course, his graphics. Now, those of you who are familiar with anime and manga know you've seen things like this where all of a sudden a character will be kind of graphically highlighted and the way Steranko does this to show you the way a film director would cut a scene, this is Steranko cutting a scene using graphic design. Now, he had been doing it in S.H.I.E.L.D. a year and two years before. Again, bottom right-hand page, a climactic, dramatic action scene. Look at the stylized coloring, the monochromatic tones. You turn the page. Anybody buy back issues from Howard Rogowski? There it is. Then he introduces the femme fatale of the story. We'll talk about her, Madame Hydra. And you might recognize some of the images from the intro with the Captain America theme song that I got from this trilogy. Uh, many of, uh, two or three of them are right here on the page. Once again, look at the use of white space in that bottom panel to open up the page a little. Because these are dense pages. I mean, there's a lot of action, a lot of color, a lot of lighting. And here's the finale of the first part of the trilogy. Now look at that last scene, beautiful, moody, of course, with the you know, literal foreshadowing danger ahead. But this final panel reminded me again of one of his classic final pages of S.H.I.E.L.D. from the very first issue. And I mean, look at the design here, using the cord to, to separate the panels, shifting from color to black and white to change the mood, using an old form of graphics called craft tint, which would develop that type of crosshat shading. And again, this was the last page of that classic first issue. Now here's another Steranko Psychedelic Shield cover from October 68, and you can see the influence that, Steran that it had because Steranko kind of did another version of that cover, but for Captain America. And of all those covers, this is probably, we'll talk about this a little later, the most familiar of the trilogy covers. Then when you turn the page, we're hit with this incredible splash page. Now again, when you first look at it, you can notice a bunch of things. Number one, of course, it's a crazy quilt of panels. How are you supposed to read this? Now, he had been experimenting a year before in S.H.I.E.L.D. with crazy quilt panels that actually get across, once again, the story. That, sh that Nick Fury is in a maze and has to get out of the maze, so Steranko designs the panels like a maze. But this is an actual narrative that you follow, whereas this one, represents the din and the cacophony of a, um, uh, what do you call it, a, um, not a, uh, an arcade, thank you, an arcade. And once again, look at all the different styles of lettering and typography that Rosen and Steranko use on these panels until you get to the final Tomorrow You Live Tonight, I Die. And it's really a beautiful page that is both beautifully graphically designed, yet also gets across this kind of havoc um, that's going on in sight, sound, and mind. Now, remember I told you Steranko colored these issues. This is the hand-colored photostat that Steranko did for that page. 
And the way coloring was done those days, they would take black and white photostats of the black and white original art, and then using a type of Dr. Martin's liquid dyes, hand color those photostats, and then mark them up for the engravers of like 50% yellows, you know, 20% blue. Believe me, it's a whole thing. But somebody has to decide these color schemes and Steranko colored his own work to make sure that the coloring would get across the impact and the pacing of the story that he wanted. Once again, here is the printed color and here is Steranko's hand colored guide. And you can see how close that the engravers followed his hand coloring um, ideas. Now here's the key to the whole trilogy in this one panel when they ambush Steve Rogers, the civilian identity of Captain America, because the bad guy says, you're a sitting duck so long as we know your true identity. And Steve Rogers thinks to himself, he's right. The whole world knows that I'm Steve Rogers. That's because a year before, when, Captain when Jack Kirby was doing the strip, he decided to reveal Captain America's identity to the world. Now, he thought that would make a good you know, plot development story, but again, he never got to develop it. So Steranko comes along and says, I took on Captain America because I thought him revealing his identity made no sense. And part of the reason why I did this trilogy, not just to give Captain America a partner again, like a new Bucky, but was to restore his identity, his secret identity. Great action poses, I mean, these are some of Steranko's greatest action poses. The stylized coloring again, continued once again, an impact panel with an advertisement. There's a nice, right? And again, the use of the classic comic book lettering. Here's the real introduction of Madame Hydra, but the panel I love will always be this panel. When, when he shifts from black and white to color and for a purpose, obviously they're watching a black and white film. Now in my book, in the Steranko chapter, there's a double page spread where I pay homage to that and talk about Steranko's use of color by having the type in red, yellow, and blue and using the white space like that. Uh, if I could take a quick, uh, make a quick announcement from our sponsor, uh, we've got uh, clip bars here uh, for everybody. Uh, to just keep passing around. 12 chocolate chips and 12 white chocolate macadamia nuts. And so the people sitting up front um, are sure to get one of the 24. Uh, anyway, and there are, no, there are no peanuts there, so no allergy problem. So just keep passing them around until you're done. We will edit this out later for the HBO special, so don't worry. Thank you. Boy, tough crowd. You know what I mean by tough crowd? That's a tough crowd. <laughs> anyway, once again, look at the minimalist coloring, working off of the black and white. Another double page spread of ads. And look at the beauty of this uh, two page segment. Look at the variety of illustrative techniques that Steranko uses to get across Steve Rogers' memories because the whole point of this team up with, with uh, Rick Jones is that Captain America doesn't want Rick Jones to die like Bucky Barnes dies. So he's torn between having a new partner and reliving memories of Bucky Barnes. So Steranko uses the black and white and these intense close ups that are very jarring. And again, that to me looks like photo reference that he got from some film still. And look at this beautiful action pose once again, using that very Eisnerian cinematic panel breakup to show a breakup of time. And here again, these are tropes that comic artists today use all the time, but Steranka was really the first one in the late 60s to innovate these type of illustrative techniques to get across the idea of the story. You get to the bottom right, once again, a kind of attention panel. He's about to open up this letter. And when you turn the page, this is what you see. Now, right away, you're hit with, <coughs> with the surrealism, which we had seen a couple months before on Steranko's last Shield cover, 
where he really did his homage to Salvador Dali and Magritte and everybody else in a single image. And you can see the impact there. And again, look at the use of white space and how Steranko lets the type breathe. Look at the beautiful, once again, hand coloring, um, using old Bende dot cut screens to get across a softer edge. Now, the running figure on this surrealist tableau that's very much like Salvador Dali's designs for Hitchcock's Spellbound in 1945, the man running on the Dali-esque surreal plane. And then you come down to this final image. Once again, look at the stylized monochromatic coloring, very offbeat color choices. You know, only Steranko would use that weird kind of mustardy brown color, but it works. You, you wouldn't think it works, but it works. But yeah, you got that ad. Now, then you turn the page and you see kind of part two of the surrealist drama that, that Rick Jones is going through. Now, I believe Steranko would have rather had this as a double page spread because I think he designed it maybe to be like this, but had to deal with that advertising page break. Because look at where he decided to put this type. Look at how perfectly it matches up here. That's graphic design. And that's why it's a shame that a, an artist of a genius level like Steranko had to deal with these horrible advertising page breaks. But so be it. So once again, look at the beautiful, subtle color changes, the gradations. You know, most compa coloring has hard edge gradation. They, there's no gradation. It's just hard edges. But Steranko found a way to soften up those hard edges, but using the hard edge of compa coloring to still be stylized. I mean, look at that coloring on the right side. That's very free and very expressionistic, but it's cut screens of hard edged color. And then when you get to the bottom right of this page, Look at this interesting thing that he does. There is Captain America about to leave, but Steranko actually has him in the same picture plane, but coming at you so that, once again, it makes you turn the page so that you're hit with the impact of this double page spread. Look at the stylized coloring again here, the solid red background the open white space. Look at the way Steranko designs that right panel <coughs> so that all the different parts of the picture give you all the information you need to know that that's a car at a curb. You don't need detail of a building behind him to know because he established that previously. <coughs> Excuse me. Once again, look at the beautiful stylized coloring. A, a solid green guy, the, the black and white there. And then shifting like a film director would to a powerful close-up. By the way, just look at how when we come down the right, the bad guy is shooting the other bad guy. He says he's got number seven, can't take a chance of him talking. We don't even see the guy getting shot until Steranko just shows us this impactful close-up of the dead gangster you know, dragging his hand down. That's all you need to see to know what happened. More Madam Hydra, another horrible ad. That upper right panel looks like a piece of photo reference from some film noir that I think Steranko used to draw that. You flip the page, again, a lot of great action, classic Captain America action with the classic sound effects. Another double page spread of ads. And then we get to the end here of the second installment. But look at the beauty of this page. Once again, the stylized coloring to highlight each person. Notice the cop is just very plain, but the other characters get very stylized coloring. Look at the breakup of the white space in that second panel. And then you come down to the end, you know, who is Captain America? So Captain America looks like he gets shot and they discover a Steve Rogers mask. So it leads them to believe who's, who really was Captain America. So we get to the next issue, except 
The next issue is not by Steranko, it's by this guy, Jack Kirby. Steranko was putting so much into those first two issues that he missed the deadline for the third issue. And they needed a fill-in issue to make the printer's deadline because missing the printer's deadline is where the real money is. They needed an issue of Captain America. So there was Kirby. He said, I'm going to help my friend Jim out. And he proceeds to do an entire fill-in issue of Captain America, I think over a weekend. <laughs> now, that might be exaggerating. Maybe it was more than a weekend. But Kirby could do an entire issue in a weekend. I think they just said to Jack, Jack, do whatever you want. So Kirby <laughs> decides, with really nice inking by George Tusca, by the way. Oh, here, look at, look at what Stan Lee writes here to kind of let readers know. So unexpected, so totally shocking have been the latest developments in the Ledger Captain America that your bullpen feels compelled to present this unique souvenir issue. First is telling us the truth. We missed the deadline. We had to get Jack Kirby to do a fill-in, but we kind of knew that. So in this fill-in issue, Iron Man, Tony Stark, begins to mourn Captain America, and through the power of some high-tech shield device, begins to look at an overview, like a eulogy for Captain America's career. And it gives Kirby the chance to kind of do a greatest hits of Captain America, as only Kirby could do it. And in this one issue, it's like it gives you literally Kirby's Captain America greatest hits. And you get the whole story of him going into the water, freezing. You get, you know, maybe the best version of Namor was by Kirby, more than even Bill Everett, his creator. But this is a done-in-one issue that goes through the kind of history of Captain America. And you're left with the very end. Things are never what they seem. So we're going to finally get the last issue of the great trilogy. And it's this one with the great gothic cover, one of Saranko's greatest, once again, doing wash tones to get across metal in comic book bende dot coloring. I'll never know. I, I should ask Saranko this next time I see him at a convention. I don't know whether Bucky was miscolored or whether that's the coloring Saranko intended because blue, I don't know whether he thought, you know, blue in nighttime lighting, you know, the green sky, but to me, that looks like it got miscolored, but I gotta ask Saranko that. It's still a great cover. And here's the splash page. Now, the first thing you should notice on the splash page is the use of television images to tell the story. Now, ever since Dark Knight, 32 years ago, we've been seeing stories about you know, using television screens to tell a story. Well, as usual, Steranko did it first. I mean, other people other than Frank Miller did it. But I think, appearing in early 69, this might be the first use of television images to tell the story. And the other thing about this issue is that we have a new inker named Tom Palmer. Now, in 1969, Tom Palmer was like 21, fresh, begins inking for Marvel. And right away, they assign him to ink Gene Colan on Doctor Strange. And Tom Palmer very quickly becomes known to this day as Gene Colan's greatest inker. And again, I could do a whole visual lecture just on Gene Colan and Doctor Strange and Tom Palmer. He was also known as being Neil Adams' greatest inker, other than Neil Adams himself, this appearing in X-Men later in 1969, after the Steranko Captain America trilogy. Then he starts inking John Buscema on the Avengers around this time, 69-70, and is known to this day as one of John Buscema's greatest superhero inkers of his superhero material. But Steranko himself did not like Tom Palmer's inking, and he's gone on record in this recent interview book by James Romberger saying that. Now, not often do professionals sort of talk about another professional's work in a disparaging way, but as you go through these pages, Steranko said he went in and, and re-inked many of the Captain America figures, but I love Tom Palmer, but when we go through these pages, I do kind of agree with Steranko. I find Palmer's inks a little scratchy, a little flinty, but 
listen, plenty of people love it, so art in the end is subjective. What I find interesting when Madame Hydra retells her origin, how she was a little girl in a violent revolution and gets scarred, this to me reminds me of when Quentin Tarantino did Kill Bill and had the anime within the movie and the origin of, um, this is the girl, Yo, uh, Yo Nishimi. Does anybody know the name of the girl in Kill Bill? I think she's the one with the maze or something that swings the thing. The point is, is, no. but I thought Yo Namishi or something, whatever. Anyway, the point is, is her origin reminds me of, of that. And listen, Tarantino's a big comic book fan. Guarantee you he was reading this. He did a whole thing about Silver Surfer. So that's what I find, once again, about Steranko being ahead of his time by using this trope that became influential years later. And just look at the way, graphically and storytelling-wise, he chooses to isolate his images, almost like Sergio Leone would cut a film into these intense close-ups because you know, her face is horribly dis disfigured. Now we get the introduction of the Avengers. Everybody wanted to see how Steranko attacked the Avengers. But first notice the mask panel and how he totally places Bucky in the eye mask as if to say, can you handle this metaphor? You know, he even says in this book, like, file that panel under metaphor of significance because it's Bucky trapped inside this identity that he's reluctant about filling because he knows Captain America is holding him to this Bucky standard and he's just regular guy Rick Jones. Again, Steranko breaking up the panels cinematically, keeping it one scene but showing you as the story progresses. And it was just nice seeing the way Steranko would tackle the different Avengers' faces. Another double-page spread of ads. And here's the funeral scene. Now, in the intervening decades, we've had many deaths of the superhero, but this is maybe the first one of the Silver Age to be handled this way so dramatically that Steranko, in a sense, almost like, once again, directing a film. And look at how he breaks up the panels this way, as Nick Fury is eulogizing him, we're seeing, in a sense, different cuts of the funeral. A film director would cut to an intense close-up like that. Another intense close-up. This, again, looks to me like he had photo reference for that figure, and that's why the figure has that impact, because of the realism. And then Hydra strikes. Now you can see the inking, once again, if you look at it, I can see what Steranko was saying. There are, there are aspects of the inking that just don't make it, and that had Sinnott inked it, it might have been a little crisper looking, but you know, your mileage may vary. You get to the bottom right, another intense panel that you're waiting for. Look at how Steranko silhouettes out in the bottom right the gravestones against the black of the hill. Steranko is as much of a graphic designer as he is an illustrator. And then you turn the page and you're hit with this double page spread. Steranko penciled, inked, colored, and lettered this spread. Suddenly the scene is shattered by a nerve, searing roar of defiance, and blah, 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 blah. You get the idea. But yeah, look at that spread. And that's Steranko doing the entire thing. Very reminiscent of one of his greatest shield double page spreads, also featuring a motorcycle and his own lettering. And then we get to the final climactic image of the series. First of all, notice this beauty. Notice how he uses color and black and white. Look at the great lettering by um, Sam Rosen. Very expressive, Madame Hydra, very graphic and profile like that. And then you get this monumental image. Maybe one of the greatest Captain America images of all time, certainly Steranko's greatest image. And when I see this, I always think of Frazetta's classic Conan, the Barbarian. Maybe his greatest Conan image, although he did a few like this 
of Conan on a mountain of warriors in various stages of killing each other. And I think this was his most recent, done in the early 70s. But that's what I see when I see this incredible Captain America image. And then you get the denouement of the story. And he goes, Bucky, as soon as the Hydra agents are near that area of fire, you turn the page, and there's second to last double page spread. You gotta love the boom, the graphicness of this boom. I mean, modern comic book letterers are doing this. I mean, I have a whole file of lettering samples like this. This was the closest. But notice how this artist uses photography. It doesn't matter. It's the same basic idea of graphic interaction between word and image and type. I mean, I went to Rhode Island School of Design, studied graphic design. This is what most of graphic design is about, is how to merge type and image successfully. Remember that double page spread in my book? I, I totally pay homage to it by giving it such prominence there. But I mean, when you look at this incredible two pages and all the various techniques Steranko employs to get across the finality, again, shifting from stylized coloring to high contrast black and white for the final uh, death stroke of Madame Hydra. And then Steranko gives you this finale, totally stylized, that now, you know, they talk about younger artists today are doing pinup pages because they want to sell their original art. But here's Steranko doing one of the first pure pinup pages, but yet it's still telling the story. So here, Steranko uses the final spread to explain that he used a, an inflatable dummy that was shot, and in order that people would think that was really Captain America and the fake mask, you see, which was fired upon and hit. But now, though the world will realize that Captain America still lives, none can be sure who is the man behind the mask. And there's, what just happened? Oh, that's weird. I don't know. Anyway, wow, that was weird. Anyway, and then you can see, and so Captain America has a secret identity once more. And that's how the trilogy ends. The next thing Steranko does for Marvel right after that is a one-shot horror story in their new Tower of Shadows. This was Steranko's original cover, very stylized, but rejected by Marvel and replaced with a hackneyed John Romita image. No offense to John Romita, but that's the cover that Stan Lee and Martin Goodman decided to put on instead. Because when you open it, you got one of Steranko's greatest tour de forces, all the things we've been talking about in this Captain America trilogy, Steranko uses and more in this story that has proven to be very influential on an entire generation of artists. His use of color, the pacing, the cinematic angles, the high contrast black and white drawing underneath the color. These are ideas and designs and styles that have been used and reused by a multitude of comic artists. The very last thing he does for Marvel in June of 1970, completely different. Oh, by the way, that's not Steranko, that's another John Romita cover. Because there's the Steranko love story, and Steranko decides to illustrate it in the exact opposite of that horror story and give it this much more decorative, open, colorful, designy drawing style. And it's all about a movie director romancing an actress. And here is the final Steranko panels for Marvel Comics before he leaves in 1970 after having too many fights with Stan Lee over control of his stories and his artwork. So here's Steranko giving to Marvel these works of art and all he's getting for it is low pay and grief. And he quits Marvel. He still stays connected to Marvel. This is a 1970 uh, Christmas card, I think, that he illustrates. And you can see his love for these characters is still there. The next time he does Captain America is for a 1970 fanzine. And this image, this figure, ends up getting reused and recolored decades later. Inked by Joe Sinnott, by the way. And then he does this poster in 1970 
maybe his single greatest uh, Captain America image. I don't think he did the type, by the way. That looks like Letraset. And it was adopted as the main image in the famous Marvel Mania Marvel fan club from 1970 to 72 or so. But look at how they featured Steranko's poster there. This was a sticker collection, and look how prominent that Steranko Captain America figure is. And here's the posters that they offered, and there's Steranko's in the middle. Obviously, Kirby did some great posters as well. And Kirby and Steranko became very good friends, not just because Kirby did that fill-in issue. Steranko, I mean, Kirby was Steranko's mentor and role model. And here they are at various conventions. There's Steranko drawing Captain America circa 1972. And there's Kirby drawing the Red Skull right next to him. And when Steranko went to do his history of comics, he asked Jack to contribute to it. And Kirby drew for Steranko one of his greatest Captain America images in pure pencil. And I mean, that's Kirby at his Captain America greatest. And that was used in History of Comics Volume 1. This was the second edition where Steranko designed the type. But there's the double page spread as it originally appeared as a wraparound cover. He even used Captain America as the advertising image for the history of comics. So that just shows you how much Captain America was his favorite character. There he is spotlighted on the cover of volume two. And then in the 70s, he starts working with Marvel again, doing their fan club, Friends of Old Marvel, called Foom. And he gets to illustrate his favorite Hulk again. Look at this kind of bizarre pose for one of the issues in 1973. A mailer, right? You like that? And there's another thing for um, Foom, where he gets to draw both the Hulk and Captain America. Over the years and over the decades, Steranko has returned Captain America every now and then to do images like this for other collections. This is very recent, maybe the last five years or so, where you can see Steranko still playing with high contrast, and he's on the computer now, so he's able to do stuff like this. And you can see, you know, Steranko's older, you know, but you can see, you know, the great design is still there. Steranko can still do these incredible Captain America figures that are really all homages to that initial Captain America number 111 cover. And it's funny, out of all of the commercial uses of this cover, I mean, in various reprints, it's been done. The only place, 1981, this collection came out from England of, of all three issues. Mostly, you can find this, and I think one of the books in the library here um, is you can find the Captain America trilogy within the larger run of Captain America in these various reprint books. Now, over here in the library, we've got volume one of the artist edition of Steranko's Shield Pages, the original art. This is gonna be the upcoming volume two, which will have the original art to, or the original art facsimile reproductions of the Captain America trilogy. But I would say out of all of the commercial uses and modern uses of this image, I really knew Steranko made it in the pop culture firmament when I saw this about six months ago. Yes, a Hot Wheels with Steranko's Captain America on it. Are you, you know, I even emailed this to him a couple months ago. I said, Jim, like, do you know about this? Because listen, he doesn't own this. Marvel Comics owns it. But you gotta love the Hot Wheels. So ladies and gentlemen, that has been my 50th anniversary of Serenko's Captain America lecture. And let me just say when, if everybody should have a business card of mine, when you go to my website along with a promotion piece, and if you don't, I have them up here with my book. When you go to my website, you'll see this, the homepage, and you can click on those various icons and they pull down. Um, it's linked to my Silver Age book site, but look, I've got beautiful books right here you can buy and I'll save you the postage. I also am an illustrator, I'm a member of Side Illustrators and I do comic book art, but for advertising, magazines, and one of my specialties 
is turning people into superheroes and maintaining the kind of photographic look. So you can see Orlando Bloom and um, Ronan Farrow and Aziz Ansari. Now, this is not my art, but this is an upcoming comic book about Alexandro Ocasio-Cortez. And I found out about it on Facebook, and I said, is it not too late for me to contribute? Because I wanted to do something with this image. When I saw this image of hers, which is one of her main images, it reminded me of the Obama Hope poster. Just that cock of the head and the way she's looking. So what did I do just recently, last week? I turned her into Green Lantern. <laughs> and there's the type. Go Green New Deal. And look, when you look at the top, it's Washington, D.C. Ain't seen nothing yet. And it's disappro she's disapproved by both political parties. BPP. Anyway, and then this is John Holmstrom, uh, New York City cartoonist. He's the guy that created Punk Magazine in 1975, very infamous or famous. This is the magazine of the punk movement coming out of New York. Well, he's starting up a new paper for the new legal pro-marijuana, and it's called Stoned Age. You like that pun? This is what you're going to see in the next issue. My marijuana superhero, <laughs> Dr. Cannabis, the green light of marijuana enlightenment. Don't get too excited. OK, so he's a scientist, and he decides to, don't even ask me. I made this up after I smoked a fat one. Anyway, there he is deciding if he can merge his DNA with THC, he'll come up with super sativa. And then, of course, he somehow hyper-electronically, the ultimate in homobotanic body integration, he merges with the super sativa and becomes Dr. Cannabis with a third eye projecting the green eye of marijuana enlightenment an endless supply of super sativa. Now that's what I call a utility belt. And his very own catchphrase, how, how are you? <laughs> Not hi, how are you? How, how are you? Anyway, notice, remember, turn the page for more. Remember, I learned, I learned my Steranko. You have to make people turn the page. And then this is what you're going to get when you turn the page. The left-hand page in upcoming episodes of Dr. Cannabis. I'm going to basically take whatever's going on in the medical realm, in the legal realm, in the psychological realm, the history of pot, the creative aspects of pot, the consumer aspects. There he's checking out a new bud with his green beam. And then all my lettering is homage to Irish Schnapp. We'll talk about him later. And uh, so, yeah, I'm hoping uh, you know this could really catch on. By the way, when you look at this image and you look at now, why is this going black all of a sudden? Do you, do you have the, uh, have the Don't worry about it. I'll fix that. The, yeah, yeah, no, no, don't worry about it. I think I know what I, what I needed to do. The point is, is I paid homage to Jack Kirby with his Kirby crackle in my Dr. Cannabis with the power of pot. But I also run a Kirby Facebook group that I would love for you to all join. I run a Neil Adams Facebook group, and I run one on the Silver Age. I lecture on the Silver Age as well. And then anybody that's going to be in San Diego next weekend, I'm going to be doing four visual lectures. Obviously, I'm going to re um, reprise this Captain America one, but also my eulogy visual lecture for Steve Ditko on the right there. 50 years of Neil Adams' Batman. There would be no dark night if it wasn't for what Neil Adams did 50 years ago. And then I'm a big Twilight Zone fan. Go to my website, The Twilight Zone Icon. I'm doing a 60th anniversary visual lecture on how The Twilight Zone was the middle ground between surrealism that preceded it and then psychedelia and modern art that followed it. I'm also doing a panel on the 50th anniversary of Marvel Mania. That's Mark Evanier, who is the original Marvel maniac. And again, there's a Springsteen thing. I was art director of First Fan Magazine when I was still a student and wrote on school design. So I just recently got in good with a little cabaret theater in New York City, and I did a visual lecture on what I think is the single greatest show. And for that theater, next month, if we're in New York, or this month on March 30th, I'll be doing my 60th anniversary of Twilight Zone lecture there. 
So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here.